So let's move to some dynamic behavior in the, into these web pages and see how JavaScript is uh, supported and integrated in the browser, which is <laughs> where, it, where it was born, actually. Hmm? Um, the first step is, of course, uh, we have a web page, and we want to enrich the behavior of this web page by loading uh, some file. Uh, basically, of course, uh, what we want to do is to have some external file to import into our uh, document, into our HTML document uh, that contains uh, the dynamic behavior. Uh, we can use the script tag in uh, HTML. By the way, script would also allow for an inline uh, say, JavaScript instruction, just inside the page, but we don't want to do that. No? We always have an external file that we want to import and uh, execute in the content of the page. So the first question, so the tag is easy, just script and the source equal to name of the file. Uh, the problem is where to put this uh, element. Uh, well, basically you can put them e everywhere, anywhere. Uh, what happens is that the browser is loading the HTML page, okay, row by row. When the browser finds the script element, it will stop reading the page, it will download the script from the web server, will execute the script, and after the script has been executed, then the browser will resume reading the page. Okay, so the script element is a blocking element during page load, during the loading of the page. While the browser is loading the script and is executing the JavaScript code, the loading process of the web page is stopped, is blocked. Okay, so uh, semantically, the best place where to put a script would be in the head of the page. Uh, because I say, okay, at the beginning you have all the declarations, you are importing everything you need. Good, nice, but slow. Because then, and, and just inconvenient, slow because the, while the browser is downloading and running the script, uh, the page is blocked. So the user will, not see, will see a blank page. And at the same time, what can the script do here at this moment? It can do much because uh, the body of the page is not available yet. So this script will not be able to manage or to manipulate in any way the rest of the page. The only thing the script could do is to set up, uh, to schedule some operation to happen when the page has been loaded. There we, we will see there's an event that will fire when the page is finished loading. So we are running something, we are blocking the browser just for doing nothing, or for scheduling for later something that will happen, on, we may happen only when the page is being loaded. So that's why developers started to put the script tag at the end of the body. So this is still a blocking operation, but we are blocking the browser when the loading of the page is already complete, basically. And the body of the page has already been loaded. So actually, this script knows all the HTML, may know all the HTML elements in the page, all their IDs, classes, and so on. So for a long time, this has been the, the normal position where to put some scripts, just before the end of the body. Uh, the, the difference is here, okay? In the, in the head element, uh, you have uh, the browser that parses the page, finds the uh, script element uh, and then needs to read the script from, from the server, execute it and then resume in parsing the HTML. In the other case, uh, uh, we have all the reading and the parsing of the HTML, so the start of the rendering of the display, and then we start to downloading and executing the script. Of, uh, it's nice uh, that we can, that we will execute the script only after the page has been loaded. It's not very nice that we also have to fetch time to pay because we could also start fetching the script uh, before, or in parallel with the reading of the HTML. So that's why 
in more recent times, uh, uh, they added two different uh, uh, attributes uh, to the script tag. They were called async first, uh, and then it wasn't working very well, and so they changed, and they added a, a defer um, attribute. Uh, these uh, change uh, the way in which the script is loaded, and they are designed to be used uh, in the head of the document, where you know, semantically is the best place to put this script. Async means that uh, the fetching of the file happens in parallel with the page loading, and the execution of the code uh, happens as soon as the file has been downloaded, like this. We start parsing the HTML, you find the um, script tag, and so you start downloading the file. And in the meantime, you continue processing the HTML. When the file, the JavaScript file, has finished to download, then you stop the processing of the page and execute the JavaScript. And then, and so in the middle of the of processing the page, you are executing the script. And when you finish the, the execution of the script, uh, you can continue resuming the page. This are, has two, two problems. One is that the JavaScript code uh, never knows when it's going to be run. Uh, it's with, going to be run in the middle of the page processing, so some elements of the page will already be there, some not, because still have to be processed. So cannot make, we cannot make any assumptions on what we can do, because we don't know whether we will be called after 1% of the page is being loaded or after 98% of the page is being loaded. Second is, uh, so the second, second problem is that if there are more scripts loading, loaded from the same page, more than one, the order in which they will be executed will depend in the order in which they finish downloading, which is unpredictable. So, you are loading a library, then you are loading your code. You cannot be sure that your code will be loaded after, will be executed after the library has been loaded, because maybe the library is lower than your code and it will be downloaded later. So when your code is executed, uh, it will lack some uh, other dependencies. Hmm? So that's why the async uh, is not used mu uh, very much. We prefer to use uh, the defer attribute, uh, saying, okay, please defer the execution until the page is loaded, but start the downloading as soon as possible. The idea is that uh, uh, when the browser sees the uh, a script tag, it will start downloading the JavaScript right now. And if there are more than one scripts being loaded, they are all loaded uh, or started to load to download at the same time in parallel while the browser is processing the page. But the execution is delayed, is deferred, that's why the name of the attribute, until the end of the processing of the page. So in this case, we have, we have all the, the best of the world. The JavaScript is executed in a predictable point in time after executing the page. The different scripts will always be executed in order in which, in the order in which they were encountered in the HTML, no matter their uh, say download times. And everything can be written in the head of the document where it's easier to see and easier to manage. Okay, so that's the sorry, uh, recommended solution here. So this means that uh, we can, if we want to add some JavaScript to our page, we must first of all create a JavaScript file. Maybe we can call it uh, script.js. And from our web page, we can call or down, download or, in, yes, download and execute this script. So in the head of the document, we have script, source, the name was a script.js, defer, and then the script. Okay, so right now, if we execute this code, nothing happens, of course. So if you reload the page, I hope nothing happens because I didn't write any code yet, okay? 
but just to check that is it's being uh, downloaded into script.js let me put an alert uh, instruction alert is an instruction for the library so a browser library that you will never use in a normal application because it offers a pop-up uh, which is not controlled by us but uh, so it's very inconvenient but it shows like this uh, it help me show that we got to this point so what it means that uh, we loaded the page you see that the page in the background is already loaded and after loading the page uh, it downloaded the one line uh, script.js and after that uh, it will execute it has executed the code the browser just executed my code that just opened this pop-up uh, with the okay button okay so forget about the alert instruction one other thing that we can do maybe it's better is to do a console.log start you are here and in this case, if I reload the page, where did the console.log uh, go? Well, in the console of the inspector. You see, we are here in the, in the console of, the, of our code inspector in the browser. So, of course, we don't have uh, uh, Node.js running. We don't have the debugger on VS Code. We write the code uh, on VS Code, but then the code is executed inside the browser, so we, so we should debug it inside the browser. There are plugins to make the connection between VS Code and the browser, but for the moment, uh, uh, it's better to, to be very clear also in our mind, where is this code running inside the browser? So where do I see the console? In the browser. Where do I set the breakpoints points? In the browser. Hmm? Okay, um, so this is how we load it, and how, after, after the, the code is loaded, it's, it's executed. Well, we have a JavaScript interpreter, and uh, what does this uh, code, uh, what can this code access? Basically. Uh, it's uh, the difference between Node.js and the browser is that the browser is a very protected environment, okay? You cannot expect uh, to visit a website and that website will download some JavaScript and this JavaScript will be able to do anything on your computer because the JavaScript is from the website but it runs on your computer. So it, you, it must be very much confined in the terms of the operation they can do. So the JavaScript cannot read your file, cannot open a, a database, cannot delete anything, cannot know even what pages are you on in the other tabs and so on. So uh, the JavaScript will be run in a, in a sandbox in an environment in which uh, it only has very limited control over the resources that it can access. And basically every resource it can access are uh, properties of one object uh, that the browser provides, that is called window. So window is a JavaScript object provided by the browser that corresponds to the current tab of your browser. Not the window, because the window may have different tabs and every tab is on a different web page. But the tab in which my web page is running is represented by the object uh, window. And from this window, which is the global object, in the node, it will be called global, okay? In the, we didn't see it explicitly because it's automatically imported. Uh, in the browser, there's no global object, it's called window. There's some small difference. And the window object gives us access to three different uh, sets of uh, objects. So it's a container of three different libraries. One is the standard library. So everything which is in the standard JavaScript library is also implemented in the browser. So we have strings, we have uh, uh, objects, we have arrays, functions, everything we know about JavaScript basically is already available in, as, as a standard library, okay? Then we have uh, some objects that control the interaction between the JavaScript and the browser itself. It's called the BOM, Browser Object Model. So some 
actions, operations that you can do with the browser in an object-oriented fashion. Okay? So, for example, uh, one um, famous is uh, window.location. Window.location is uh, the address that we have here, is this property. So inside this tab, I can read window.location and it will print, oh, let's check it. And it will give me window.location. If I run this page, it will give me exactly what we have here. So it's a property that we can read. It has nothing to do with the web page. It's the browser that knows the information. It's not the content of the web page. If we read the location, we know the URL in which we are. If we change the location, the browser will navigate away and go to a different. So window the location equal to something else will uh, navigate away from this page and ask the browser to reload a different web page. Hmm? And, um, and so all the op operations of the browser resizing the screen, adding or deleting history, going back in the history and so on, are all operations that a web page can do. Of course, they are confined to this tab. You cannot uh, uh, close the whole browser. Maybe you can close the tab. And, uh, uh, and they are accessible uh, to the JavaScript. And we, we won't use them very much, basically, okay? Uh, it's a low-level control of, of, the, of the window, and it sometimes, uh, uh, except for re redirection uh, with the window location, uh, it's not nice if you resize a window for, for a user. Okay, my browser, my size, my window, don't change it, okay? So it's not very fr user-friendly to change something in the browser of the user. Uh, and the third aspect, which is the most important one, is the document object model which is a, a set of objects uh, uh, accessible by window.document or just document. Uh, document is the reference to a tree of objects that represent the currently loaded web page, the current content of the loaded web page. So from the JavaScript code, we don't want to see the HTML code. Imagine you want to, I don't know, change something, add one row to the table. And imagine this is a very long string of text. Well, not imagine, this is a very long string, it's just a text file. So if I gave you this string and I told you add one row, you would hate me. But because you will need to pass this string, understand where the tags are open and close, uh, all the spaces, all the indentation, and all the uh, opening and closing text. Uh, and just to find the point in which you are going to add some code, it will take uh, hundreds of lines of code, and then it will be wrong, because maybe you don't consider some special cases. Comments. Uh, uh. And uh, so, uh, it would be practically impossible to do anything useful if the JavaScript code would see the, the HTML page as a text file. On the other hand, the JavaScript code will see the, um, the content of the page as a sequence of objects. So there will be one object for the body, one object for the div, one object for the paragraph, for the table, and so on. And so we can interact with the page in an object oriented fashion, that's why it's called the document object model. And it will be the interface that the browser gives us, gives to the JavaScript code, to be able to interact with the page. So all the JavaScript programming in the browser basically is interacting with the DOM. So that's, I, we need to learn it, okay? Um, you may have more than one script in the, in, the, in the page, but they actually, they all share the same space. So be careful about global variables, because if you have one script and another script is creating another global variable, they are, they, they, they may be conflict if they are the same name. So once more, uh, try to avoid anything in the global scope. 
Uh, of course, uh, we can have modules like with the import statement and so on to, to load the modules, uh, uh, load the extra code. Uh, let, let me say better. You could have one script and another script in the page here, okay? Uh, they are loaded independently and they are run, say, in parallel in the same environment. Or you may load one script and this script on turn, on its turn, will import something here. So it can be an import statement from here. And this is, would be better, okay, because of course uh, the module, is con the loading of the module and the scope of the variables from these modules are controlled by this code. We'll see the import uh, uh, syntax later uh, because it requires some help also for, for the compilation. Uh, so it's, it's a complex issue, it's not just an instruction. Okay, and what is the, we'll see something about uh, uh, the, 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 ob the object models later, but again about uh, how the JavaScript is executed in the browser. Uh, I already said many times that uh, in the JavaScript execution is asynchronous, uh, and it was okay. We accepted that uh, while using Node.js. It was clearer when we were using Express because we understood that the different HTTP requests could come at any time. The browser is much more asynchronous than Node.js because uh, the user is continuously looking and using and playing with the page. So uh, the JavaScript called here should, in, should adapt uh, or should uh, respond or react uh, to every user action when the user selects something or clicks on a button or writes in some text or something like that. And this may happen in any order at any time. So you cannot say, okay, to the user, you must first enter this and then the second one. No. It will enter information in the order that it wants. Okay, so it's all asynchronous. Some uh, asynchronous operations come from the library, you know, the timeouts uh, or promises or something like that. Some asynchronous operations come from the user actions. User actions are transformed. So when I click here, or even when I move the mouse. Every user action is transformed into an event. So it's an object called event that is created every time a user does some kind of action. I type a key, I move the mouse, I click, I drag. Every time I do something, the browser creates a new object called an event, and you can decide whether you want to react to this event. I want to react, of course, when the user clicks on this button. So I will define a handler for the click event on that button. So there are a lot of actions that will be triggered by an event caused by the user, caused by one action of the user. Um, and these events uh, can be handled or can be ignored. Many events are ignored because when I move the mouse, nobody cares. Except maybe when I move the mouse uh, over a button that will change a bit its background color. So this is something that the browser is able to do. The browser already has, thanks to the interpretation of the style sheets, uh, knows how to handle that. Uh, if I go here, the, the cursor changes its shape. If I click here, the cursor gives a focus to that um, text area or text item. So in this case, these are all predefined behaviors. So the, event, the events that are generated by the user action are already caught, are already handled by the browser itself with a default behavior. We, if we want, we could redefine this behavior but otherwise, it will be, it's already handled by the browser. Or we may define our own behavior. So for example, the, this button, the browser already defines the 
hover action, so what to do when the mouse is over the button, but it doesn't define the click action. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything if I click here. So this is something that I must define. If, a, if an event is not, def is not handled by the browser or is not, end is not handled by the user, it's thrown away. It's just ignored. Hmm? So we have uh, thousands of events per second. Most of them will be just thrown away, ignored. Some of them will be handled by the browser. Others may be, will be handled by the user. So all of this is happening, say, thousands of events at a time. Um, in a synchronous way. But uh, JavaScript is still a synchronous language. A single, sorry, not synchronous, but a single threaded language, sorry. It may execute only one instruction at a time. Still better, it will execute only one function at a time. The minimum unit of execution, like we said in Node.js, is one function. Once a function starts, it will run to completion. Okay, uh, and so there's no possibility of interrupting a function in between. And so how this happens? It happens thanks to a management of functions to be run. Uh, this is called the event loop or the execution loop uh, in JavaScript. It's summarized by this picture. You imagine you have no, some normal JavaScript code, okay? And this code allocates objects uh, on the heap, on the memory. OK. This is just a uh, sequential code. Normally, what sequential code does is to call functions. One function calls another, which calls another, and so on. OK? Every time you call a function, this function is put into a call stack, normally. And uh, uh, a function is removed from the call stack when it returns. So you have the stack of the currently running function. The first function is the main, and then it calls a second function that calls a third one, and so on. This block is the synchronous execution code. So whenever one function uh, completes the execution, returns, the JavaScript engine will pick the, re the remaining function from the call stack. In other words, uh, if I finish the execution of a function, then I will resume the execution of the caller function of this, because it's there on the call stack. Function A calls B, which calls C. When C terminates, it's removed from the call stack. B is now the top of the call stack, and its execution is, re is resumed, is restarted. Huh? Then when B finishes, then we go to A. Then we may reach a point in which uh, uh, the call stack is empty. There's no more sequential instructions to execute. Okay? And this it may seem strange, but in a synchronous environment, it's normal. Remember our files in expert.js. We had an app.listen, which is not a blocking instruction, was uh, uh, scheduling uh, the, the, the application. And then the program, the program ended. So basically, there was no more code to execute until we got a, a, a request from the HTTP. So it's normal for a synchronous program that, that is not executing anything. But it has a lot of uh, event handlers or connection handlers uh, ready to be fired. Okay? So if the call stack is empty, the program is not finished. And what happens if the call stack is empty? Then the JavaScript environment looks into this uh, event loop queue. What is that? This uh, is a queue, first in, first out queue of events that have been scheduled by, by the browser or by our JavaScript code. So for example, remember the set timeout that we wrote at the beginning. When you write set timeout, we are actually taking a function and adding that at the end of the queue of functions to be executed. So every time we set a timeout, we are adding something to the queue. Every time a user clicks, we are adding an event to the queue. 
And these events just stay there. They wait until it's their turn to be executed. So the browser then takes this on click. OK, there was a click event. It happened sometimes in the past. So you need to process this. This event tender is a function. This function is put into the call stack, and then the execution starts for this function, for this event tender. If this function calls other functions, then they are put in the call stack again, and everything is run until the event tender, the original event tender, terminates, returns. Then the call stack is, is empty again, and we extract the next item from the queue. So, JavaScript is mostly into sequential execution mode. Unless the sequential execution is terminated, there's nothing more to do, and then it goes and picks the next event to be executed. This means that uh, the event tender of two different events uh, are never run in parallel, always serialized, one after the other. And this is a strong suggestion for us programmers to say, okay, if I'm writing some code for an event tender, exit as soon as possible. There's no preemptive multitasking here. All the multitasking should be explicit. If I need to do something, I will do the first part, and then maybe it's, it's, if I need to do something slow, I will schedule something for later. And so I, the, the second part of my computation will, be, will happen later, when I will be pulled from the, from the queue again. Okay, so never write uh, long-running uh, uh, event tenders. And every time we have a promise, we have a catch, uh, uh, or we, we are creating or returning a promise, uh, actually, we are adding to this queue. Okay? So all our promise-based object uh, is nice because it only runs one snippet of code when is the time to run it. It never stays in ways and waits. Hmm? The novelty here is that uh, this uh, callback queue doesn't contain only timeouts, doesn't contain only promises, now, or asynchronous callbacks from library functions. Now it contains also events that are injected by the browser. So it will, it will be a mix of functions scheduled by our own code, promises, for example, and uh, functions scheduled by the browser itself, event handlers. Okay? But the, then the mechanism is the same. So, from one hand, we must exit quickly from an event handler in order to avoid blocking the browser. We are blocking the browser, everything. Nothing can run if I'm running some JavaScript code. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we have a very simple computational model. So we don't have any real concurrency. We don't have to think about a variable being, being modified while I'm reading it and so on. So when I'm writing my code, it's a sequential code. Hmm? That will usually run some or schedule some, some callbacks uh, or so on, but the, well, line by line, no, nobody is mangling my variables while I'm executing the code, okay? Or my data structures. There's no problem of uh, uh, you know, iterating over an array and with the risk with some, something else changing the content of the array. It cannot just happen, okay? There's only one thread being executed and it's never interrupted in the middle. All sequential code is always run to completion. Hmm? So it's a strange model, but uh, there's some protection for us. Uh, we don't have to, to, to deal with all the concurrent uh, programming uh, uh, issues. Um, OK, so this is the, the summary of what is happening. No? Uh, basically, everything is functions uh, and it, this is in a way with function calls, which are synchronous calls, and events uh, that can be external or, or internal events. <coughs> okay. So this is the execution model in the browser. What can our code do? 
uh, as we said, uh, uh, the browser provides the one object called window, and from the window object we can uh, access uh, the browser itself or the document. Hmm? So the most important object in all the browser is the window of the document that is the head of, of the browser of the document of the page itself. Okay. In this terminology, document and page are the same. The HTML document is the web page, okay? So we always talk about uh, the web pages, uh, uh, but now uh, technically they are called documents. I don't want to spend too much time about the window um, uh, object. We are using console a lot. Console.log, in this case, refers to the console object provided by the browser. It's not the console for Node.js, okay? Uh, we don't need to write window.console because Windows is, a global, uh, is the global scope. So every property of window is automatically visible. So we write console instead of window.console. We write document instead of window.document, but they are all property of the global space. Hmm? So we are using console, we are using the document, we practically never use the other ones. And now we come to the document. Um, we found a very nice tutorial that you know, uh, it's, uh, explains very well all the aspects of, of the DOM. Uh, we here we will try to focus on the on the more say core information, and then go by example. Okay, in, in see in, in seeing how how to work with that. So DOM do, document object model. The name says it all. It's an object model that represents. Uh, the document. And since the document is basically a nested tree of HTML tags, the document object model will be represented as a tree. We have one root node which is uh, of type HTML, two children nodes, uh, they may have children on their own and so on. Okay? So basically the DOM is a tree of nodes. And uh, these nodes can be searched. It can search for a node with a given property, with a given name, with a given location, with a given attribute. It can be read. I can read uh, the property of a node, and the property could be maybe the color of that element or the text that the user, that is contained into a, an input box that was written by the user. And they can be modified. It can modify a property of an element. Can, I can make it appear or disappear by changing the visibility property. I can uh, uh, dynamically modify this tree. I can remove some branch. I can add some branch to this tree. And every time, uh, and, and the content of this tree is re linked in real time with the, with the visible part of the web. So you can imagine the, the document object model as a, as a data structure. And on one side, this data structure is managed by the browser. Every modification to the data structure is immediately reflected in the browser. And every modification or every interaction made by the user in the browser is immediately reflected in the DOM, in the object of the DOM. The property will change in real time. And on the other hand, this data structure is accessible to our JavaScript code. So we can never talk to the user. We can never talk to the web page. We always talk or read and write uh, the objects in the DOM, the nodes in the DOM. And uh, modifying the properties of the nodes in the DOM will automatically uh, talk to the page. And this was necessary because to standardize all this because every browser from the implementation point of view is very different. But the JavaScript code needs to have a standard representation of a, a web page. No? And this is the DOM. We can do any operation as you immediately reflect. There's no, as long as there's a lot of protections about what JavaScript can do to your computer, there is basically no protection to what you can do with the web page. You can do everything. It's your tab, it's your page. You have all the permission to do anything you want to the DOM, not outside it. And, uh, okay, it's a library, the DOM, with uh, only a handful of type of, uh, of, uh, of nodes. Okay, you have uh, 
nodes, node is a, is a class, okay? Is a type of object that has several subclasses. Node is a generic class with subclass uh, text or element or comment. Basically, most of the nodes in a page are elements. Element is a div, is a p, is anything that corresponds to an HTML tag. An HTML tag corresponds to an element node. Everything which is outside tags, the text here, is a, another node called text. Okay? Uh, is, a, is a node of type text, a subclass of node called text. And all the attributes like uh, href here or type here are attributes of an element are nodes of type uh, attr attribute. So everything you write in the HTML page will be converted either in a node, sorry, in an element, or in a text node, or in an attribute node. And they are, of course, linked. Okay? An element has the link to its children elements, has a link to its father element, has a link to uh, its text, contain text inside, has a link to its attributes nodes, and so on. So you can reconstruct everything from this model. Uh, I had a picture, I don't know, I don't think I had a picture, okay. And so the main object is node with many subclasses for the different types of nodes in this tree. And another type of, uh, uh, of objects is a node list. Node list is a sort of array, similar. It's a, it has an interface similar to an array that is uh, made for accessing a, a list of nodes. Um, it's specialized for a list of nodes because, by definition, list of nodes are, are dynamic, uh, and so we don't use uh, normally arrays. Uh, we, can, we, we use similarly to an, an array, but it's not really an array, okay? It's a, it's a node list, uh, and we have most of the functions that uh, are already available for arrays. So, for example, when you have a node and you are asking to that node, which are, which are your children, it will return one node list object from which you can iterate it and get each and every node in the object itself. Um, we, we can see the DOM in the console of the browser. So we loaded this page here, okay? We can write document. So here is the, is the interactive console of the browser. So I'm talking to the JavaScript interpreter in this page. And uh, the document is a node of type HTML document. By the way, it has also an inspector where in, in the interactive console, it's not just printing the element, but it can uh, show you all the properties of those elements. And you see that every node is a class with hundreds of properties. Okay, um, we have, for example, document.body, which is a property that maps to the, node, to the body node of our page. And if I want to say, what are the children of the body? Children of the body is a HTML collection, which is a, a, a subclass of node list that contains uh, four children. The first one is a container fluid, a div. The second one is a container main, and then we have the footer, and then the script that we added before. And so if you want to check the, the main container, we could uh, document dot body and then children uh, the one is the main container. And so which are his children? Okay, the body, the main container has uh, one, two, three children. An intro row, the lead message, 
and the div that contains the table, the immediate children, of course, the div that contains, and so on. You can see the tree. And these are just variables, okay? If I want, I can have, uh, I can store this uh, const main div. Yeah, the main div would be the number two. So main div now would be the div that contains the table, for example. And then you can, you can go in. I can access all the properties. You see that many properties are, now we will see them, but uh, um, can be read or can be changed. For, for now, we just navigate, navigate it there. But for example, if I want to navigate it back, I can ask main div dot father or parent, sorry. Parent node. Which is your parent? So we children, we navigate down with, uh, uh, by navigating the children list, uh, we navigate uh, across and uh, with parent, we can navigate up. So we can move across this tree and query uh, the type of nodes and so on. But of course, navigating this way is very like a driving blind. You know the road and you need to exactly to know when to, stir, to, when to turn right or left. Uh, there's no guidance. I, I want to be able to say, okay, give me this green button. What is the object representing this, this green button? How can I get it? So there are, of course, a lot of uh, methods to search the DOM from a specific, for a specific node. And these are DOM queries that uh, return one element, so the reference to the object, giving the ID. If I know the ID, if, I, if in the HTML I wrote the ID for the element, I can read the ID. And it will return me the node uh, ID should be unique in an HTML page, so it will return me just one object. Or by tag name. So, for example, all the buttons. Get elements by tag name, buttons, button. And it give me, will give me a node list of all the buttons in the page. You see the plural, elements, because ID is unique, so there's no plural, only one. Tag, tags, tag name is uh, uh, the element name can be repeated, and so you, you, can, you may have more than one. Or by class name, with the attribute class. Or uh, more in general, by query selector, which is a very powerful syntax. Uh, that's used, you use the same syntax that you use for selecting CSS elements, uh, and it will return you all the elements that match that syntax, okay? So I want the green button. How can I select it? Well, uh, did they mark it in some way? No, because it was lazy. It doesn't have any ID. Let me add an ID. It's equal to uh, add the button. So if I have an ID to an element, I can in this in the, let me reload the page, of course. Okay, I should be able to, okay, I need to reset this because main div, of course, is not defined. Um, when you reload the page, of course, all the local variables are, are destroyed. So I could uh, select uh, const, uh, a green button from the document uh, get element by ID and the name of the ID was a string was uh, uh, add button okay. 
And so now green button actually points to this element. So I, if I can find it once, and then I can uh, uh, do whatever we want with, the, with this element, okay? So for example, green button dot uh, uh, no, 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 sorry, no, as, they don't, I don't want to try and guess uh, properties. Uh, there was one visibility or I want to make it disappear. Hidden. hidden. So in, in real time, I make the hidden attribute to true. Now it's false, I make it true, and the button goes away. And uh, now I make it false, and it will reappear. Okay, so the element is still there, but the browser interpreted that as an invisible element or so on. Or I want to, maybe you are not logged in, and so uh, you want to disable. I want just to show it as a disabled button. So you see, it's grayed out, it cannot be clicked. These are just stupid property, but to show that uh, the DOM is actually the real control of the, of the web page. Every property of the DOM has an effect on the, on the web page and vice versa. Uh, so these are all the methods for finding elements in the page. You can find elements starting from document, they will be searched in the whole page, or we can search some elements from some other element, and in that case we only search in a subtree rooted at that element. So maybe we, we have one section of the page, we want to find the button only in that part of the page, we create uh, uh, we, sorry, we call the get elements uh, from the intermediate node and instead of the document, if you want. Hmm? So in this case, we, we will find all the paragraphs inside the main section. And the main section, of course, was found uh, maybe by ID, for example. Um, and of course, uh, we can also use the query selector if we are familiar with the, with the CSS syntax. Uh, so in this case, we are selecting all the elements uh, with class bold, or the element with ID foo. And in this case, the hash sign in CSS stands for ID selection, which is the same of, of the, the first two are equivalent, um, and so on. So every CSS query can be, so if you want to find something in a complex way, probably this query selector all is the best syntax, uh, you just, because the, of the power of the CSS query syntax. Once you find the node, you, you can navigate around, and these are the attributes that you can use uh, for navigating around, the parent node, the previous sibling, next sibling, first child, last child, and child nodes. I first, uh, before I used parents and children, because, you know, along the years, uh, many, uh, there were many changes uh, to this interface, uh, and so these are the official names, uh, but also you know, simpler names were, are still supported. So once you have a node, uh, you can say, okay, uh, I have the table and I want to check all the rows or delete uh, all the rows, uh, we, have the re we can navigate those uh, very easily U using this property. These are, um, they are properties, they are not functions, right? I never used a, a, a function call, a method call before. And so every attribute of every element, for example, body ID equal to page, is mapped into a property of the object. So document.body, body is a shortcut for the body of the element because it's useful. Dot ID maps the property ID. So what you write in the HTML is converted into an attribute of the object. And you remember that the attribute can be um, accessed by dot notation or by bracket notation, it's the same. There's nothing special here, just different ways of accessing an, um, an object property. You can read or you can write uh, these operate, these, uh, all these properties. 
Um, you, also, you also have some uh, methods for handing attributes of a node. Okay? Normally you have an attribute list. These attributes are injected as properties, but if you want to find or search for a given property, you, you have this uh, uh, get attribute or set attribute. But if you already know the name of the attribute, it's faster just to write the dot, uh, the dot notation to, to access it, to read and write. You can modify the tree. Create element, create text node, creates the two main types of elements. So I want to add something to a page. I want to add a node with some text inside. So I need to create a text node, and then an, an element, maybe a P, a paragraph node, and then add it to my code. Okay, so for example, let's do it in, in the console again. I want to create, uh, uh, to add something, maybe in the title, I don't know, okay? So uh, I want to, to create a, a, a new paragraph, quindi, so, const, paragraph, uh, I create, document, create, uh, element of type P, a new paragraph. And then I can create a, a text node inside this paragraph. So again, const text document dot create, um, create text node. And create text node, so let me check. Uh, yeah, requires the text. Hi. So now I created one paragraph and one text, which are disconnected from each other, and they are also disconnected from the web page. Because P, P, par, sorry, paragraph, it's a P, it's an empty P. But I can add the uh, uh, sorry, children. Uh, sorry, append child, append, append child, sorry. TXT. So, I, now, paragraph is a paragraph with a, chi with a, with a new child that contains some text. Before it was empty, and now it contains uh, some inner text that was high. Huh? So imagine you are building this tree one node by uh, node by node. The, the paragraph node, text node, then you append a child. So now this paragraph has one child before it didn't have any. And uh, how can I make it appear? I need to append it to some part of it, because not, right now it's a small tree which is disconnected from the main document. I need to append it somewhere, I don't know, maybe in the body. Document dot body dot append child. Of my paragraph. And when I execute this, look there. Uh, we append at the end of the body this new paragraph, uh, which is not formatted, not aligned because it's some of the containers or so on. It's painful, okay, to work in this way because we are we need to add the one at a time and connect all of them, and at the end adding them to the DOM. But these are the primitive operations that give us total control over the tree. Um, Okay, the append child, of course, is for uh, inserting them. When I need to insert new nodes into the DOM, okay, you have the append child that will insert at the end. I can also insert before, or can replace a ch uh, children, one, one or more children. There are no, many variations. Uh, for example, when one element contains many elements, uh, you can add a new element before 
or before the, before the block, or before the first, before the, after the last, or after the block. Okay, so there are many methods, many variations that you can use to, to manage all these trees and populate the content of the page. There is also a trick if you want to, if you want to uh, have a shortcut. If you want to build something, you can just have a string of a fragment of HTML and give it to the um, to the browser with, with the to the inner HTML attribute. Uh, what does it mean? If I take inspect any element, for example, this this row here, sorry, I want to take the row. Uh, Okay, this tr element, for example, it, it has many, uh, sorry, let me, okay, this t row, okay, I made, a, I created a, the, the inspector to create a, a temporary variable just for me to inspect it. It has uh, many attributes. One of the attributes is the inner HTML which is all the HTML as a string between the beginning and the end of the tag. So tr string slash tr. All the HTML that normally is made of different nodes and children and so on is also available as a string. Okay, who cares? Nodes are easier to navigate. But if you want to change it, if you change the inner HTML attribute, it will automatically change and reconstruct, rebuild all the nodes corresponding to that fragment. Hmm? Um, let's try it. It was called temp0, this variable, temp0 dot in HTML. I will change it to uh, something like, uh, I don't know, heading3. I destroyed the table slash heading three and then uh, another paragraph. Please load. Okay, this will be at least uh, four or five nodes if I need to build it in, as, as DOM nodes, because there is an H3 node, a P node, two text nodes, and one node list that keeps them all together. If I just uh, press this, you see that the first row has been destroyed, deleted, and substituted with this text. This is not a very valid HTML because it's substituted uh, um, an H3 in, instead of a table. But what I wanted to show you is that uh, if I need to create some HTML structure, and if, I, if, if for me it's easier to create it as, as a string, by changing the inner HTML attribute, I will use the parser, the HTML parser, which is inside the browser, to pass the string and create nodes for me. It's a way of, of saying, okay, please, browser, take the string and give me the tree of elements. Of nodes, so that we can uh, I can append them somewhere. So the inner HTML is doing this trick for us. Yes. Sorry. No, the page is loaded before, and then we execute the code. If I modify the page until I reload it. Okay, when I load the page, it's load the, we have the initial version. This initial version is then disconnected from the server that created the page, and it's, all, it's given to the JavaScript. JavaScript can do whatever it wants. Of course, the, the, the initial web page is never changed because it's, a, it's in a server. It's, uh, okay. You can do whatever you want locally. You can modify it dynamically. Of course, as soon as you refresh, 
everything is reloaded again, all the variables are destroyed, and the JavaScript is, re is restarted from scratch. So if, you, if we are building an application, we should be careful that the user never refreshes or never navigates to a different page that it will destroy all our variables. We need to start from the beginning. Okay, so what can we, okay, we are doing some modifications here. We can uh, modify the classes uh, of, uh, of an element. So, for example, with the booster classes, we can make it uh, larger, smaller, appear, disappear, or whatever you want. Uh, no, there's a lot of, uh, um, we can control the CSS styles. Okay, but the real, Interesting part comes when uh, we are uh, doing some event handling. So I want to show at least one example, and then next week we'll play with this, okay? Uh, the interesting part is when we add some event listener to some elements. As we said before, when I click on the plus button, do something, or the delete button, do something. So uh, every element in the page generates events, and these events can be managed by our, even, by our functions, our event handlers. There is a function called add event listener that adds a specific listener handler, call it whatever you want, for a specific type of event generated by a specific element the window or a specific uh, node. So actually this is saying, let's say this one. Uh, this is uh, an element with a given ID. Whenever this element generates the mouse down event, call this function. And this function can do whatever we want. So for example, I already have, uh, let's put that into JavaScript. We already have the way of finding the add button. So const add button equal to document. Now we're writing the script, okay? Get element by the add button. And I can register an event handler on this button. So add button, add event listener. The event is click, and the action is a callback that prints something, for example. Okay, maybe we should really add a new row to the table. This is what we are going to do next week. So the basic mechanism is, uh, let's open the console. If I click on this button, I have this message. So what happens is that the, the browser, if I click on another button, nothing happens, of course, because I don't have any event listener associated with that event on that button. Okay, so uh, the, the, every element generates many types of events, and by many I mean this table of events. So you can really act, uh, go and listen to some specification. The most interesting ones are, of course, click or key down, key up when you when you type something or you change, change when you change something or when you click on something. Usually are the most interesting one, but then you can control really every aspect of the user action. And to have every action, to every user action, you can associate your function. And inside this function, normally, remember that you have the full control of the DOM. So inside this function, you can add, delete, check, modify every aspect of the page in response to some user action. Okay? So this is the playground for next week. And here, now it's being recorded, yes. Thank you.